Hi, I'm Dr. David Cunnington and I'm a sleep physician working here in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, it's my pleasure today to talk with you about uh, CPAP equipment and really how all the machines are not the same. And having a good understanding of the different algorithms is going to be really important in managing your patients and getting the best results when you're using CPAP. Just to start, a bit of a shameless plug. Uh, if you're interested in sleep, I do run a podcast on sleep that produces episodes each month at Sleep Talk Podcast in all the podcast apps. And I'm pretty active on social media around sleep, both on Facebook and Twitter. So follow me on those uh, social media platforms if you're interested in keeping up on the latest in sleep. I'm actually quite active in telemedicine. Uh, in Australia, our Medicare, so our universal payer system uh, for health, actually provides rebates for patients outside of major capital cities uh, to see uh, specialists like myself uh, using uh, telemedicine or video conferencing. So this is an example of uh, an appointment I was doing yesterday, reviewing somebody's CPAP uh, treatment. Uh, we use Zoom as a platform because it meets all the privacy standards and it also allows screen sharing so I can talk to someone about their CPAP data and about their uh, results. And I think it's a really effective way of managing patients particularly in a country like Australia where uh, distance uh, is really an issue. Uh, even in Victoria, which is a very small state, uh, many patients live five to six hours drive from their largest uh, capital city or regional city where specialist services are available. Really what I want to talk about today is that not all CPAP machines are the same. You get sold uh, on the fact that, well, whatever the numbers coming out of the machine, um, you've got to believe them, take them at face value. But in actual fact, some of the data I'll show you calls that into question. Because we're used to looking at these type of outputs from the CPAP devices. So the device will give data on what pressure it's set at, it'll give data on total usage, uh, data on leakage, uh, and then also data on the respiratory indices. In this case, the apnea index, hypopnea index, a derived uh, AHI. But are these numbers actually correct? And how much weight should we put on these numbers? There's a couple of nice position statements that I'd recommend that you have a look at because they give some really nice background, uh, both about the machine algorithms and how to think about tracking people on CPAP. So the ATS put out a position statement uh, in 2013. And then here in Australia, the Australasian Sleep Association uh, put together a statement in 2017. I was involved in uh, developing uh, some of that document. And the table that appears in both of these documents outlines how different PAP devices detect respiratory events. And so the three uh, or four most common devices, so the ResMed device at that stage, the S9 model, uh, Philips Respironic System 1 unit, the DeVilbus uh, IntelliPAP smart code uh, with smart code data retrieval, and Fisher and Paykel uh, devices. If you look at the middle column where it talks about how apneas are defined, you can see that there is a difference uh, between all of the devices. So for the ResMed device, for example, uh, the two minute, sorry, the two second moving average root mean square of ventilation has to fall below 25% of the long-term ventilation. Whereas for Philips, it's a moving window of three to four minutes and float, it's got to decrease by more than 80%. Uh, and so there's just not that consistency and there's even more variation in hypopnea event detection. It's not surprising because even in the way we score hypopneas in the sleep laboratory, there's a lot of variability from laboratory to laboratory, but the definitions of events uh, differ from device to device. Some really nice bench studies looking at how auto titrating PAP devices actually perform. And these are really quite informative because this is what we're interested in is what's it doing for our patient. If I send the patient away and tell the device, look, just range it to the factory default settings, minimum four, maximum 20 centimetres H2O for a PAP uh, device, is it going to do what I want it to do? And what is it actually doing? So this particular study uh, from Zoo et al uh, was from Air Liquide Healthcare in France. And if you look at the top or the reference channel, so in the middle panel, they simulated obstructive apneas. So that's each drop in ventilation is a simulated obstructive apnea. And then in the three uh, graphs below that are three common machines and how those machines responded. The solid line is what the pressure setting was or pressure delivered was. 
And in the line above that is the residual uh, changes in ventilation. And you can see the icon, so that's D6 in this uh, paper, uh, did a reasonable job of reducing obstructive apneas. The REMSTAR uh, device, System 1 in, in this paper, uh, reduced obstructive apneas, but there were still uh, some events there and significant reductions in ventilation. And the S9 uh, auto set performed the best out of all of them uh, with a little bit lower pressure, but actually able to reduce the events. If you look at the right hand panel, uh, these are simulated hypopneas rather than obstructive apneas. Again, the icon was partially effective. Uh, the Philips uh, device did almost nothing. Uh, and the ResMed device uh, was the most effective of the three. So think about that for the individual patient you're sending home. Do you expect that there's gonna be that amount of difference in the effectiveness of the devices? No, probably not, because we haven't really thought about it in that way. We're often a bit device agnostic or algorithm agnostic and just you know tell the distributor they need this particular pressure. But this data really suggests that we should be thinking about it in which algorithm is going to suit this particular patient. Uh, from the same paper, uh, this is looking at uh, the machine's ability to respond to snoring in the middle panel and to central apneas in the right hand panel. And again, a range of different results. So the interesting thing for me is in the right hand panel, if you look at the machine's responses to central apneas, what you want from a PAP device is it to not increase pressure with central apneas. You can see the majority of the devices actually did increase pressure in response to uh, simulated central apneas rather than recognising them for what they are, that is central apneas, and maintaining the same pressure. Uh, in a separate study, this one's from Spain, but published around the same time, uh, they looked at things in a similar way, but presented the data a little bit differently. So in this tabulated data, they did a bench simulation test uh, of both obstructive events and uh, obstructive apneas and hypopneas to see how the machines responded. Uh, the code uh, in the left-hand column, A1 and A2, uh, the uh, ResMed devices, the AirSense 10, A2 in the responsive uh, setting. Uh, device C is the other one to look at, and so that's the Fisher & Paykel Icon uh, device. They were the only two devices out of all these devices, and the code is in the legend at the bottom for the devices, that normalised breathing. None of the other devices normalised breathing, whether it was the Dreamstar, number B, uh, the ResSmart D, Somnibalance E, System 1, the Philips Respironics device uh, F. And if you look at the second column along, so Pmax, so the maximum pressure that the devices delivered is incredibly variable with the Philip, sorry, the ResMed device, not in the responsive mode, higher than everybody else and arguably a bit too high. The uh, A2, so the ResMed device in the responsive mode, uh, probably being about where it needed to be and getting the residual events uh, reasonably low. But then most of the other devices being significantly lower in terms of their detected pressure settings. And that'll come out in the data that you look at when someone's on an APAP device in telling you what the recommended pressure is for that particular patient. Another way of looking at the performance of the devices is this graph from the Azeta paper. Uh, these are the two extremes of what happened to pressure with the devices in the first 30 minutes of the bench simulation. Uh, so the blue is the uh, AirSense 10 in responsive mode. The red is the DreamStar uh, device, and they were the two extremes, with the uh, AirSense 10 being quite responsive. Uh, 12 was indicated as the estimate of the pressure that was required to control sleep disordered breathing, and the DreamStar really being not at all responsive. So the Australasian Sleep Association, in looking at this data and looking at their recommendations about CPAP data, one of the interesting things is that they really say that we should take that PAP-derived AHI as not actually being an AHI at all. There's actually very little data showing that it correlates with a laboratory or PSG-derived AHI and really should be called something different. So the proposal both from the ATS and the Australasian Sleep Association is to call it AHI flow rather than AHI. Because if we call it AHI and we call what we derive from polysomnography AHIs, then people just buy into, oh, it's the same. 
they reflect the same things. But in actual fact, they reflect quite different things. A couple of cases just to demonstrate these differences in devices and some of the pitfalls of just taking this data at a blind face value. As this is a CPAP device set fixed pressure of seven centimetres H2O, but a significant number of residual respiratory events. So the AHI residual events is 23.2 uh, events per hour. And what you wanna do is try and understand, well, what are these events? So that's where you can get a bit more detail with the data. So you can either get the compliance type of graph that ResMed provides, which is in the left-hand panel, uh, showing a summary over a couple of weeks of usage, what the pressure is, how much leak, what the residual AHI is. Or you can get the detailed graph, which gives you one night's data, flow, pressure, leak, and AHI. But you can actually get more data than that. So you can drill down into the flow data and actually get breath by breath data. And in this sort of situation, that's really helpful because looking at this breath by breath data, you can see from the flow signal that it follows a pattern very typical of Shane Stokes respiration with a cyclical oscillation between under and over ventilation. Uh, another example, this is a ResMed device in auto titrating mode with a minimum pressure of five and maximum pressure of 16 centimetres H2O with reported pretty good control of sleep disordered breathing with the reported AHI being 1.1 events per hour. One of the parameters the machines give you when they're in auto titrating mode is a predicted pressure to control respiratory events. ResMed reports out a 95th centile, uh, Philips Respironics reports out a 90th centile, and often those numbers will be used to set someone's fixed pressure, but are they reliable? Um, this is the data over a couple of weeks, uh, suggesting that at least the peak pressure is around 15, 16 centimetres H2O. But if you look at the night by night data and the detailed data within a night, the pressure setting is really capping out at 16 pretty consistently through the night, suggestive that there may be a degree of over titration uh, and therefore that's going to artificially increase your recommended 95th centile pressure. Uh, in actual fact, when you looked at leak data, there was high leak and it was the high leak that then corresponded to the machine estimate of pressure needing to be high, artificially elevating the 95th centile pressure. So we have to be careful about just taking at face value the 95th centile pressure and saying, right, that's somebody's fixed pressure requirement. And the final case, this is a polysomnography of someone having a titration study. And you can see from the CPAP mask pressure, which is a transduced, transduced delivered pressure during the study, that there's a lot of variation. The technician's really gone up trying to control respiratory events, gone down, gone up again, gone down again, which suggests that they're, they're having trouble controlling the sleep disordered breathing. This particular person was in the community on a Philips uh, Respironics device. So this is the uh, time trend data from their device. They were on a fixed pressure of 10 centimetres H2O on the left hand part of the graph. And during that part of the treatment, there was a high reported percentage of the night in Shane Stokes respiration uh, and the uh, obstructed airway apnea index was a bit lower in the bottom, bottom graph. Then about halfway along, the pressure got increased to 14 centimetres H2O, which reduced central sleep disordered breathing. And if you look at the bottom panel, increased obstructed sleep disordered breathing. And you know that's very counterintuitive. As the pressure goes up, you should get less obstruction. Maybe you're gonna get more centrals. You're gonna induce some pressure induced upper airway uh, change. But when you actually look at the breath by breath data, it nicely shows that this is a mixed obstructive sleep disordered breathing pattern. Think of that as a high gain chemo uh, receptor type of sleep disordered breathing. So it's not gonna be that very rhythmical, mathematically predictable Shane Stokes respiration that the machine's gonna pick the central sleep disordered breathing because it didn't pick it, the central sleep disordered breathing, but it's also not totally obstructive. It does have that tailing off of flow at the end of each event. So that mixed obstructive and central type of pattern. So I hope I've been able to show you that we do need to take into question what some of the parameters are that come out of PAP devices. Don't use the term AHI from the devices. I challenge you to consider using the term AHI flow. And also look at the devices. They score and respond to events differently. So when you're prescribing a device, you're used to prescribing a pressure, 
Should you be prescribing a pressure or should you also, as an additional uh, variable, be recommending a particular algorithm for patients? Thank you very much. And if the technology is working right, I should appear on Zoom pretty soon to answer some of your questions.